Hello everybody, it's uh, 1 o'clock Central Time, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Matt Delacluse. I'm the General Manager for Rayco Rents. I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us for our webinar, Advanced Topics in Sound Level and Noise Management. Our presenter today is uh, Dr. Gary Brown of Eastern Kentucky University. In this 45-minute webinar, we will cover the following. Brief review of noise and sound level measurement basics octave band filters, why they matter, and what they can tell you, valid sampling events, how to pick who and how many employees to sample, tips and tricks for sampling noises above 120 decibels, and ask the expert your questions answered. Dr. Gary Brown uh, has more than 25 years experience in the field of environmental, occupational health, and safety spanning both academic and practical fields in the United States and internationally. He is a certified industrial hygienist, registered sanitarian, and diplomat of the American Academy of Sanitarians. He is on the staff of the OSHA Training Institute located at EKU, has presented numerous national and international conferences and universities, and is actively being involved with undergraduate student research. Dr. Brown has a BA in Environmental Studies from State University of New York, Buffalo, a master's in science in environmental and occupational health from Hunter College, and his PhD in occupational health and safety from University of Alabama, Birmingham. He is currently a professor and graduate coordinator in environmental health science at Eastern Kentucky University and provides consulting for governments and private entities. He is extremely interested in the promotion of the field of environmental and occupational health, industrial hygiene, and increasing the number of OEHS majors nationally. We welcome Dr. Brown as a speaker and thank him for sharing his expertise with our customers. Now I'd like to turn the microphone over to Dr. Brown. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we'll get right into the webinar. If you have any questions, you could type your message and I'll do my best to answer as many as I can. So we're going to talk about industrial noise um, and I'll cover a little bit of the basics, but we're also going to talk about areas that a lot of us don't get into only on an occasional basis, less than 60 decibels and above 125, say. So um, the first thing we're going to start off with is frequency. Frequency is important because Higher frequencies are more damaging. Lower frequencies are much more difficult to control. When you're using the A scale on a noise dosimeter, you're missing a lot of those low frequencies. Low frequency is what we humans hear as pitch or bass sounds. High frequencies are treble sounds, okay? Um, people who tend to lose their hearing, lose their hearing due to overexposure to noise at high frequencies. So they'll miss the S, the T, the consonants and sounds. They'll miss the doorbell. They'll miss the telephone. They have an easier time with the consonant, the vowels, excuse me, A, E, O. Also, they can hear you better when you whisper. So noise is truly measured in pascals, but we actually convert those pascals today with our wonderful instrumentation into the decibel scale. And the decibel scale is very large scale and allows us to measure a very large range of noise. Zero decibels is the threshold of hearing for normal young people. This is kids, say, five to seven years old, even though they may not listen to you all the time they can actually hear you years ago you could take kids from a rural area and kids from a city area in elementary school kindergarten first second grade and when they did their hearing test the city kids had slightly better worse hearing than the country kids that is no longer the case um, all kids today have ipods um, earbuds play video games, getting surrounded by noise all over. 
when I was growing up, I'm a little bit older. I remember when TVs had two little speakers. There was no remote control. Cars had two speakers. So as we become more overwhelmed by noise, one of the challenges for us as occupational health and safety professionals is to have people protect their hearing. The problem is if you've got a kid driving around in a car that's 120 decibels, 115 decibels, and he comes into your facility and it's a 90 decibel facility where they need to wear hearing protection, to them it sounds very quiet. Because whenever you go up 10 decibels, it sounds twice as loud. Whenever you go down 10 decibels, it sounds twice as soft. So that's one thing that I'm seeing as I'm getting older is that younger people are having hearing loss at a much younger age. It's called sociocosis, and it's hearing loss due to social um, factors. So if you look at this, this is how we would measure noise. If we were looking at sine waves, the frequencies, and also the decibel level, okay? They're the same frequency, they're the same time duration, okay? But this one, the top one, is twice as loud as the bottom one, all right? So this is actually what the instrument's picking up. The instrument's picking up um, the actual sound pressure level. When we talked about octave band analyzers, they're gonna look at the various frequencies. As I said before, um, decibel is a logarithmic scale, so we're not going to be able to add decibels, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But every 10 decibels sounds twice as loud. Every three decibels doubles the sound, and we're going to talk about adding decibels in a couple of slides. But what that means is if somebody's exposed to 100 decibels from two pieces of equipment, each piece of equipment's 100 decibels exactly, and they're standing in the middle, their noise exposure would be 103 decibels. Okay, you don't add the 100 and 100 and get 200. When there's a zero to one decibel difference, you add three to the higher noise level. A scale is what all dosimeters use. And what dosimeters on the A scale are is that high frequencies are much more damaging than low frequencies to people. So people overexpose the noise tend to lose their hearing at 4,000 hertz. It's called the 4,000 hertz notch. And this could be when you're 10 years old or 100 years old, all right? If you lose your hearing due to old age, okay, that is more of an equal loss across all of the various frequencies. So if you're using a noise level, a sound level meter, and you're only looking at the A scale, and you've got a lot of low frequencies, you're missing some of that noise. The C scale is what you want to use when you're looking for sound control, hearing protection selection, because that measures all frequencies equally. Where you're going to get your complaints as an employer with nuisance noise is going to be in your low frequencies. If you've ever been to a party or had a party at a neighbor's house down the street, you don't hear the treble Part, you hear the bass, the boom, the boom, boom. And we have a weighting scale up to N for research, but occupational health and safety professionals don't have to worry about those. And this is exactly um, 
what I was discussing before. When you use the A scale, a lot of your low frequency noises filter out, which is not use, useful for community or nuisance noise. Another thing is a lot of municipalities set up their community noise standards to look at the decibel level in various frequencies. So there you need to use an octave band analyzer because of the fact that low frequencies are much harder to control. A low frequency wave is a long wave. So it can pass through buildings, things of that nature without losing a lot of energy. A high frequency wave is a very peaky wave. And so when it hits buildings and things of that nature, it loses a lot of the energy much quicker. So whenever you put an enclosure around a person, it's going to increase their sound level. It's going to increase the noise they're exposed to. One of the experiments I do with my students is I have them um, put their radio on what they normally have it on. And it's amazing because sometimes they're shocked that they're listening to the radio at over 100 decibels. And I have them do that with the windows up and the windows down. And it's even better if they have a convertible um, or like a little ranger truck where you can open up the side windows and the back window and that will decrease their noise exposure several decibels. So that's a good example to show them about reverberation. Reflection is the sound strikes a surface or several surfaces before reaching a person. This is some of the issues you'll see sometimes when they're putting up those road barriers um, to control noise, those walls. Those walls really help out the people who are living right next to the highway, but the people say several blocks away their noise is actually generally increased a little bit because the noise is reflected. So typically, most occupational health and safety professionals have used a sound level meter and have used a noise dosimeter. If you only are in a pinch and you don't have a sound level meter, you can use a noise dosimeter as a sound level meter. But remember, if you've got a lot of low frequency noise, that's not going to pick that up. The last instrumentation is an octave band analyzer. And I'll talk about when you would use an octave band analyzer. This is a piece of equipment you don't use very often. Um, so a lot of people are not familiar with them and they really don't understand the whole difference about the different bands. Okay, background noise. I only worry about background noise if I'm looking to reduce the, to see how much noise is coming from one particular piece of equipment. If I'm doing noise sampling in industry and there's guys and gals playing radios and things of that nature, I have them keep their radio on because noise is noise. It doesn't matter where it comes from. It's equally damaging. And the, all occupational standards for noise are really based on how much energy can your ear take before it starts having damage. OSHA says you could be exposed to 90 decibels at eight hours, 95 decibels, four hours. When you increase five decibels, you cut the time in half. NIOSH, Department of Defense, Department of Energy, the rest of the world uses it, what's called a three decibel exchange rate. They start instead of 90 at 85 decibels for eight hours. At 88 decibels, you can only be exposed to four hours. And I give this the example of a pool. Picture your ear 
and the energy your ear can take is like if you had a pool and you fill up the pool and the water filling the pool is the noise that's hitting your ear and your ear is that pool and it only can take so much water. Well, what happens when that pool is filled and you keep adding water? It's going to overflow. Well, that's when damage occurs with your ear. If it takes X amount of time to fill your pool with a certain size hose, if you double the size of that hose in the flow, you will cut the time it takes in half for the pool to be filled. And the same thing with damage to hearing. If people, and like my students, if, they're, if you're exposed to 115 decibels, it's equivalent of you working in a factory for eight hours at 85 decibels every minute and a half, two minutes. Decibels don't add up arithmetically, okay? So I've talked about this and I'm gonna uh, explain some more. If you have a more than a 10 decibel difference between two sources of noise, like this one on the back, one's 90, one's 60, the 90 is the only one you read because the 60 doesn't do anything for noise exposure, doesn't add anything, doesn't add anything to the sound pressure or the sound level. So, 10 decibel increase is perceived as twice as loud. If you have 200 decibel piece of equipment, you add three decibels and their exposure is 103. So this is the rule of thumb when you're adding decibels, okay? Because decibels are logarithmic. It's a base 10, same as the pH scale. The pH scale, when you go from a pH of seven to eight, eight is 10 times more basic than seven. When you go from eight to nine, nine is 10 times 10 or 100 times more basic than seven. When you go to 10, it's 10 times 10 times 10 or 1,000. So rule of thumb is if there's a zero to one decibel difference between two sound levels, add three to the higher number. If there's a two to three decibel difference, you add two decibels to the higher number. Four to seven decibel difference, you add one to the higher number. Um, and then eight or more, you don't add anything to the higher number. But we use 10 just to be safe. Okay. All microphones have internal noise. Okay. So microphones, the closer it can read to zero decibels, the more inexpensive that noise, I mean, that microphone is because you're reducing self-generated internal noise, and that could be the electricity running through the wires, a bunch of different things, okay? Um, community background noise is one issue that you may need it if you've got a factory that's located to a very quiet neighborhood and there's no traffic, for example, and they wanna check on the weekends, what's happening, the difference in levels, that would be an issue. Also, autometry booths, um, soundproof rooms, things of that nature. That's generally when you're really worried about um, the, the uh, floor of the microphone. So it's electrical circuit noise and then noise generated by air turbulence at the microphone. Um, 
and this data is available from the manufacturer. So if you've got a minimum measurable level of a microphone, for example, so you've got a, a microphone that the lowest it can read is 25 decibels, okay? And so if you put it in a soundproof room, the lowest level it's going to be able to read is 25 decibels, okay? Now you go in there with that, instrument you're very quiet but you're actually generating about the same amount of noise 25 decibels that microphone is going to read 28 decibels because a zero to one decibel difference you add three to the higher The second one is airflow. And airflow is more of an issue for us occupationally. If we're outside doing construction workers and you've got some pretty heavy winds going on, um, if you have a sound level meter and you think, for example, that noise may, the wind may be affecting your sound level meter. If you click it on the A scale and then on the C scale, the noise levels on the sound levels on the A scale will be lower than the C scale. So you know that the windscreen is ineffective at the wind you're exposed to. You need to use the manufacturer's windscreens. Um, they're the little black sponge looking things. And my students are like toy testers. They beat the snot out of all my equipment. And the one thing they lose all the time are the windscreens, which makes me crazy. Um, on the edge, they're attached, so they really, unless they suck on them or something, or rip them off, they're pretty good. It's with the noise pros that we tend to lose the windscreens. And on the sound level meters also, because in the box, um, the windscreen a lot of times isn't attached. And my students, I don't know what they do with it because sometimes the sound level meter balls are a little bit bigger. So I think they're, you know, think they're a Nerf ball or something. So a lot of times the all manufacturers will give you what the windscreen will give you an equivalent noise level at that exact wind. The issue though is a lot of times you don't know um, if the wind's getting too much. So that can be a challenge. Uh, one manufacturer, for example, stipulates a self noise of 56 decibel for a screen microphone exposed to 25 miles an hour wind. This is okay for occupational exposures, but if you're doing community noise, this is a bigger issue. Um, so you would want to wait for a community noise for a lower wind. Another way is, is you can take the windscreen off and put it on, okay? And that's really 
an easy way to determine. If you take off the windscreen and your noise levels go up by, say, 15 or 20 decibels or even 10 decibels, and then you put it back on, um, then you know that the windscreen is working, okay? Um, that's one quick way you can figure it out because a lot of times you have no clue what the wind is. Again, it's highest at low frequencies. If you are able to have a sound level meter and you do the trick I talked about with A and C, that can help you a lot of times. A lot of times, there's certain areas of factory, like if you're near a glass melting furnace, it's going to have more wind or more turbulent air just because of the heat and the temperature differentials. Three types of microphones, um, random incidents, uh, pressure, and uh, directional. And really that determines on how you have to point your instrument, okay? Uh, random incident, you wanna have it at a slight angle, direct is directly on, and a pressure is to the side of the actual microphone. All Quest microphones are omnidirectional, so you don't have to worry about that. Most of these instruments will do 130 degrees, 135. They'll go down to negative 10, negative 20, maybe even negative 30. I'm from Buffalo, New York originally, and it can get cold. I worry about battery life much more with cold than hot. Um, humidity, not an issue, even in, say, Louisiana. But an issue is rain. If it's raining, you can fry these instruments. And I don't really worry about atmospheric pressure unless I'm somewhere like Denver or Mount Everest or something, because usually the pressure, you're gonna calibrate it the same pressure you're going to be at, and then you're going to use it. The only time it may be an issue is if I um, calibrated my instruments in Kentucky and then flew up to Denver. Always use your windscreen. Um, really, most manufacturers say 15 miles or less. They will um, protect and eliminate the wind noise. Radio frequencies, magnetic fe frequencies. Uh, most instruments today are RF protected. And so that shouldn't be an issue. If um, you think it can be an issue, you can put the microphone in the calibrator when it's turned off. And if the sound level doesn't drop, then you know it's you've got RF or magnetic field issues. Usually the instrument we use initially when we go into a facility to determine if there's a noise issue is a sound level meter. A sound level meter will generally have some sort of integration. Uh, the integration being that it will store up to a minute and it'll give you the average reading over the past minute. If you don't have an integrated sound level meter, it's like you're schizophrenic because the noise is bouncing up and down, up and down and going all over. Um, and so we use the sound level meter to figure out where we need to sample or we need to start working on um, noise control efforts.
all sound level meters are um, at least provide readings in the A network. Most are A and C. Slow meter response that the average time about 60 seconds and they read from 80 to 130 decibels. When you go less than 80 decibels to read or above 130, that is a type one meter and that's more expensive. The higher the decibel range a meter can read and the lower decimal range a meter can read, the more expensive the meter. So class two is what we use. Class one is what usually I've had to use and I'll talk about when we've had to use those. And class zero, I've never had to use, but they're very expensive and they're for very specific um, uses. So, a type two microphone will only measure up to 143 decibels. A type one will measure up to 160 decibels. A type one you need to use, for example, if you've got a lot of presses, because that can get above. If you're doing a lot of, like if you're doing work on a firing range, which I've done over the years, indoor and outdoor, because when a gun goes off, it's going to be well above 143 decibels. The problem is if you use a type two meter, say when they're shooting the gun each and every time, it's at 160 decibels. That person's exposure, you're missing 17 decibels of their exposure each and every time. So the best thing to do is if you think you have an issue where you may need a type one meter is to rent a type one sound level meter first. That will tell you if you have levels above 143 decibels and then you can rent the type one meters. They are more expensive because they're a little bit more complicated. So you always want to, if you possibly use an integrating sound level meter, because like I talked about before, it measures the equivalent sound level averaged over a short time, usually a minute. You always want to measure about three to nine meters, three to nine feet from the source, one to three meters, because you want a chance for that wave, especially long waves, okay, the low frequency waves, a chance to start reaching their full energy potential. Best example I can give of this is elephants years ago, they didn't think they were really speaking as much as they do. Elephants speak in a such a low frequency that we cannot even hear it. <clears throat> and so the lower the frequency, the longer the wave. Elephants live in Africa and Asia, they're spread out. If you wanna talk to somebody, in elephant language, you want to talk low, fre low frequency so you can go long distances. So a sound level meter is instantaneous and noise dosimeter is what we use to determine personal exposure. I've gone places where somebody's held up a sound level meter next to a person's ear for one to three minutes and says that's their daily exposure. That's not their daily exposure. You need to have a noise dosimeter on your employees, a representative number to actually know what they're exposed to. Generally, all noise dosimeters start keeping recordings or storing the data at 80 decibels because that's generally what most standards want you to do. Their threshold level of 80 decibels, okay?
that can be adjusted. Same thing as a sound level meter, type 2 microphone, 143, type 1, 160. If you think you've got the situation, rent the sound level meter first. Know if you have that and then rent the type 1. So, all noise oscillators give out two readings, time-weighted average and L average. Time-weighted average takes whatever information's in that bucket and divides it by 480, eight hours. L average takes what's in that bucket and divides it by the time that it's run, okay? So if you've only run 60 minutes, the L average is going to divide by 60, where the time-weighted average is going to divide by 480. So if you sample for less than eight hours, you need to use the L average. Okay. The L average is always going to be greater than the TWA for less than eight hours. And L average and TWA will be equal at eight hours. All right. And when you sample, you want to get the majority of the shift. So if it's an eight hour shift, I try to get seven and a half hours. If it's a 10 hour shift, nine and a half, 12 hour shift, at least 11 and a half, and 16 hour shift, at least 15 hours. Octave band analyzers, octaves cover a range of human hearing from 20 to 20,000 Hertz, and it's really a different frequency content. This is important for noise control. Because remember I told you low frequencies are much more difficult to control. So if you've got low frequency waves, you may have to put quite a bit of insulation in, okay? Uh, most noise is not a pure tone, but rather consists of many frequencies. So we generally break it down. Low frequency, more annoying, less damaging. High frequency, hurts our ears more, but generally not as annoying because if you're having a party, you won't hear it. And it's much more difficult to control low frequency than high. So an octave band analyzer, and the majority will have 10 filters, and these are the 10, okay? Um, it's got the lower band limit for the lowest one is 22, upper band's 44, and the reading they're giving you is 31 and a half. So what that means is it's looking at all the noise from 22 hertz to 44 hertz and giving you the average, okay? Same thing with the other ones. And it's all the way up to um, 16,000 hertz. 16,000 hertz, a lot of us can't hear. 8,000 hertz, a lot of us would have a hard time. Little kids could potentially hear up to the 16,000. That's even doubtful with the 8,000. Yeah. So an octave band, um, I talked about this in the previous slide, is a range of frequencies such the highest is twice the lowest. So they double, they go from 63, 125, et cetera. The one third is something that you generally are only going to use in research or if you've got some real noise issues. So what an octave band analyzer is, is a sound level meter that's actually using an analyzer and it breaks apart the different frequencies. The old ones, some of you may remember, you would actually screw on the octave band analyzer onto the sound level meter. And it tells us the pure tone components of noise and what we really want to use it for in occupational environmental health issues is noise control, but also community noise. Some community noise standards say you can't be above a certain decibel level at certain hertz.
they're generally not needed for compliance except for community noise. An extremely useful tool to diagnose and find noise sources. You can use them in hearing protection selection and they're needed for calibration of audio meters. So the nice thing, for example, is you can determine if the noise, majority of noise that people are exposed to or this piece of equipment is lower or higher frequency because it's never going to be a pure frequency. It's going to be a range of frequencies. But if it's lower, there's certain hearing protection that's better. If it's higher, there's certain hearing protection that's better. And same thing with sound control. On any standard, there's three parts. The first is criteria level. This is the sound pressure level that if people are exposed to for eight hours, they will have no risk of hearing loss, okay? Only OSHA uses 90. ACGH, NIOSH, DOD, DOE, rest of the world's using 85. Threshold lamp level is sound pressure level below which level that no damage occurs. It's usually set at 80. And then the exchange rate is either five decibels for OSHA, three decibels for everybody else. So we've already talked about L average. Okay, so L average you use for less than eight hours. Time weighted average always is divided by 480. And a lot of those simeters read in dose. The dose really, you can convert it easily to decibels, but it's a, sometimes it takes a little bit of math, which people don't like. Um, so, but a hundred percent dose for the OSHA standard will be 90 decibels. A hundred percent dose for the ACGH standard would be 85 decibels. So the dose is dependent on what your criteria, what your um, standard says. This is the last slide. And the TWA equals L average at exactly eight hours, and same thing with dose, less than eight hours, use L average, and eight hours, use TWA. I'm done. If you have any questions, um, please let me know. All right, Dr. Brown, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, if there are any specific application questions, uh, everybody can feel free to give me a call at 866-R-E-N-T-E-H-S, uh, so RENT-E-H-S, or 866-736-8347. You can also reach me uh, by my email at matt at racorents.com. Um, if you want to know more about the technologies we supply, please follow us on social media. We put lots of good technical tips on my blog, blog.racorents.com. You can also follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. We do record all these training sessions, which you'll have out on YouTube in a couple days. Uh, if there are any specific topics you'd like us to cover in our webinars, please send me an email with the subject. We have access to a lot of product and process specialists. Uh, please let me know what we should cover by emailing me at matt at racorents.com. Uh, let's see if we have any questions. We'll go through those. Looks like we do. Give me a second here. All right. We'll get these out. Let's see. It says here at uh, NYS. DOT, our plow operators are exposed to noise at about 85 dBA as a TWA. Most of that noise is low frequency road and plow noise, i.e. less than 1,000 hertz. As a result, it is difficult, control, difficult to control. Do you have any suggestions for lowering their exposure? 
Uh, let's see. US DOT requires CDL operators to be able to hear a whisper, which makes provision of earmuffs and muffs pr uh, problematic, although there's no way we can hear a whisper while plowing. That's a tough one um, because my guess is they're getting most of their ex noise exposure through the windshield. On the low frequency, the windshield's not going to. Um, provide really any reduction maybe some soundproofing material between the engine and the cab um, I'd have to think on that one but feel free to call me and we can discuss too the next one, uh, you can make a good guess on the contribution of the low frequency to the total exposure by the differences between the A and the C scales. I guess that's just a comment. Generally, just a couple decibels at most. Um, it's not a ton. It's not going to go from like 90 to 100 or it'll go like 90 to 93, something like that. It's, it's, it's not going to be a ton. It'll be several decibels in my experience. Another one is, uh, what is the most challenging situation you've seen to get noise measurements? Construction, a lot of times. Um, iron workers, because when they're erecting steel, say in New York City, things of that nature, that's a challenge because you're going to get such wind up there and things of that nature. So that that's probably been the biggest challenge. That or in um, on a ship, if it's rough in that, because these things can't take water very well, and especially salt water. Okay. How many samples should be taken at any place or area of coverage? The most I can do noise dosimetry is 10 people because you've got to be watching, seeing what they're doing, things of that nature. It really depends on how many people are at your facility. Okay. Um, and then I want to ask, uh, best location for monitoring, shoulder, hard hat, et cetera? Shoulder, you want to be near the ear. You want it next to the ear or as close to the ear as possible. Uh, is generally gonna... the hard hat, the problem with the hard hat is um, it's going to cock their hard hat if it's not a noise pro. With the edge, it'll put some weight on the side of their head. Okay, the other one was, why does OSHA have a 5 dB doubling rate and all others have a 3 dB doubling rate? This is a significant difference. Politics. Um, when it got changed, when it got implemented, that was the standard in 1970. Um, for them to change anything takes forever. Look at the new silica standard, the hexavalent chromium standard. They would love to, but it, it'll literally take them years, if not decades. Um, how would you measure somebody who's wearing a protective helmet like uh, welders? Helmet. You got to do it on the outside. There's no way to do it on the inside. All right, next one. Do you have, uh, during renovations of healthcare facility, do you have recommendations for analyzing noise exposures from construction to healthcare staff? Are there any controls that can be recommended prior to renovations of building? Yeah, I've actually um, done some work. One of the things we did was actually did particulate monitoring um, in the ORs because that was a concern to make sure in, in various different parts of the hospital. You've got to work with your contractors and, and whoever's going to do the design and your architectural firms, but if you can do things to reduce exposure significantly. Um, types of tools, uh, insulation, construction materials, things of that nature. That all can definitely 
be done. I, it's never going to be eliminated, but it can be minimized. Okay. Is a dosimeter with uh, octaband analyzers useful, or would a sound level meter with OBA be more useful? As a consultant, I could be in various environments, so just looking for thoughts on best outlay of dollars for equipment. Noise dosimeter can be used as a sound level meter. Sound level meter can't be used as a noise dosimeter. And a noise dosimeter, you can't use, I don't know of any that does octave band analyzing. It's only sound level meters. I've seen one out there that's got a one-to-one -one, uh, octave band analyzer on it, but okay. I've never seen a, a one-third. Yeah, so, um, but that's, again, the size for the noise dosimeter with an octave band analyzer is going to be pretty big. Let's see. Are there any regulations based around impact noise, or are there any good published papers that indicate the adverse effect of impulse noise? Yes, there are. In input, and this is something, impulse noise, you need to have your people wear earmuffs at a minimum, and pr probably also earplugs, because earmuffs prevent bone conduction. What happens with impact noise, like competitive shooting and um, presses and that, is that sound will actually transmit along your jawbone and go into your internal ear, inner ear. Okay. Uh, I have challenges with people already wearing all types of PPE, welding hoods, wet process aprons, etc. Any suggestions for microphone placement with these challenges? That's just, you sometimes you got to get creative. Duct tape is your best friend. Um, zip ties, whatever you need to do. Uh, I've seen people actually, Galson Labs, SGS, they actually have a uh, sampling vest you can put on people to hold the equipment. Somebody makes a comment about the DOT snow plowing question. Uh, scraper blades can be sourced in materials other than steel. The result in less uh, noise and vibration. I think carbon fiber is one. It's also easier on the road surface. All right, good deal. Comment on that one. Uh, let's see. I thought, uh, somebody says, I thought A scale was best for monitoring employees. It sounds like you think C scale should no, be. No, A scale is the best for employees because we want to do what people hear. But when you're using a noise dosimeter with the A scale and you're trying to do noise control efforts, um, then you got to do C. But yeah, A scale is what we want because that mimics what the human hear, ear is exposed to. Another one. I always thought the mic needs to be in a free field, i.e. away from the head. I usually collect samples just an inch or so from the edge of the shoulder. That's fine. Long as it's, you know, I, I generally try to put it right, like, right at the edge of the collarbone. And that's, I guess, where that person does it. Yeah. Are there any pros and cons of the newer earplugs that have speakers in them, those with or without limiting devices? Without limiting devices, you're getting more exposure with, yes. I mean, they're great on the noise canceling earplugs and uh, headphones and stuff. The only problem is they're expensive. Custom molded earplugs, people love them, but you've got to follow the manufacturer's instructions and you may have to get them replaced every year, every two years, every three years. I've gone to some facilities where they've had custom molded plugs and these uh, people have had them for five, six years. Okay, let's see. Uh, this one says A scale for dosimetry, but C or Z scale for impact slash max noises? Question mark. Yeah, yeah. For if you're if you're looking at your uh, your overall noise exposure, yeah. 
And especially if you've got impact noise and you're going to look at an office and things of that nature, you definitely want to have your C scale because that's what they're going to hear. Okay. And uh, in the DOT snowplow case, somebody recommends uh, noise canceling, some sort of noise canceling headphones. Okay. All right. That's all the questions uh, that have been posted. Thank you, Dr. Brown, for the great right. presentation. Everybody Thank you, have guys. a great safe day. You too. Bye-bye.